Hey everyone, welcome to Tony for party. Uh, I mean Tony for you. Have you ever noticed that from all over the world, in almost every mythology, there is always a god of some kind of alcohol? Gods of fertility, war, the sun, creation itself, they all make sense, but on the flip side, there's also a god of partying and getting drunk. Seems much less important than the god of all life, but in many cases, these gods were some of the most worshipped of their region and culture. From around the world, one thing remains constant. People love to get drunk and party. Though you'd be forgiven for thinking most of these gods of alcohol were the same carefree people, the worship of these deities can be pretty serious, and their veneration was not to be taken lightly. So let's take some time to learn a little bit about these deities and pour ourselves a tall glass to spend some time with the different gods of alcohol. This video was made possible by the great people over at my Patreon. If you'd like to support, check the link in the description below. Also, I have a Discord, so if you want to come chat with me and other wannabe theologists, come join and hang out. First up is Dionysus, possibly one of the most famous gods of alcohol. In this case, wine. As the son of Zeus though, his domain spans much farther than simple booze however. He is also the god of pleasure, vegetation, festivals, and also mad frenzy. The circumstances of Dionysus' birth are incredibly unique, even as far as gods go, and was quite possibly the first god born of Zeus with an actually sweet story, uh, kind of. There once was a woman named Semele who was a devout priestess of Zeus, and her god often observed her in turn, under the form of an eagle. Semele sacrificed a bull at an altar without hesitation, and then went to wash herself in the nearby river. Upon seeing this brutal display of devotion, Zeus became absolutely infatuated with the woman and he revealed himself to her. The pair began a relationship and saw each other many times. One thing led to another and Semele came to carry Zeus's child, and Zeus was so happy that he swore an oath to her. Upon the very river Styx, anything that she so desired, he would make so. It got pretty complicated after Zeus's wife, Hera, found out about this whole thing and, as she often does, lashed out at the mortal woman rather than her cheating husband. Taking the form of an old crone, Hera visited the temple where Semele was stationed and spoke words of heresy to her. Whether or not this Zeus she knew was even a god or simply an imposter ready to do or say anything to get with a beautiful priestess. When Zeus finally got around to seeing his mistress Semele again, she demanded to see his true form. Zeus initially refused, as if a mortal sees a god, let alone the god of gods, true form, they would surely die. But then Zeus remembered the oath he made to grant any of Semele's requests, and against his better judgment to save the woman he cared for, he assumed his divine essence. Immediately after seeing this, Semele burst into flames and could not be saved, not even by a god. But Zeus did manage to save the unborn child she carried as the fruit of their love. Zeus, with quick thinking, decided to save the child by sewing him into his own thigh and carry them to term. A few months later, a boy was born, who was named Dionysus, and due to his circumstances, he was referred to as the Twice Born, once from tragedy and once from love. Having been carried by Zeus for that long of a time, Dionysus was not referred to as a demigod, but rather a full-fledged god which was unheard of since he was born of a mortal woman, but his power spoke for itself. In Dionysus' early years, he was raised by the deity Salinas, who himself was associated with winemaking, and the young Dionysus took a shine to the art, as well as copious consumption of the drink. Dionysus often traveled throughout the land, teaching winemaking and agriculture to people in the form of a human, and needless to say, the average men and women of cities and kingdoms absolutely loved Dionysus, and his cult involved all things fun at the time. The god was thought to have the power to inspire ecstasy, love, and inspiration, with his cult being credited for very important art and literature created at the time. Painting, singing, and performing plays of tragedy and comedy alike, they were seen as an amazing addition to the average person's life. But oftentimes those who held power did not see it as a blessing. Now, there are a surprising amount of stories regarding Dionysus that involve slaughter and bloodshed, but always as a retaliation. Well, sort of. In Thebes, there was a new king crowned, named Pentheus, and his first order of business was to ban the worship of Dionysus. Needless to say, Dionysus was absolutely livid at this act, and on a mission for retribution, the young god caused the women of Thebes to enter a frenzy of violence and sexual activity. 
Pentheus found Dionysus in his human form and captured him under the assumption he was simply a follower of the cult. After some time, Dionysus, with his silver tongue, managed to convince the king to cross-dress and see for himself what the women of Thebes were up to. The king did so, and when he arrived, climbed the tallest tree in the area to witness the horror. The women were tearing citizens apart, limb from limb, with inhuman strength, and also doing some less than mentionable things in a nice educational YouTube video. The king was then spotted and the women madly ran after him. Pentheus met the same fate as many others of his nation, being ripped limb from limb, and one of the women having done this to the king was his own mother. Pretty grim stuff for a god of drunken revelry, but the story of his wife is much more heartwarming. Being a party animal, Dionysus had many lovers, but in his heart he was a romantic. In the story of Theseus, after he killed the Minotaur, he sailed back home with the two daughters of King Minos. During the trip, Theseus decided to marry one of the girls and abandoned the young Ariadne on the island of Naxos, stranded and alone. There, she would be found by Dionysus, and he fell in love with the woman in spite of her tragic past and circumstances. After their union, they had many children, but shortly after, Ariadne would be killed by the god Artemis in the events of the Odyssey by Homer. Actually, there's many stories of Ariadne's death, but this is the most simple one. Dionysus was so heartbroken that despite his domain being partying and indirect influence, he traveled to the underworld alone. There, he faced off with Thanatos, god of death, and Hades, god of the underworld, but he did not meet them in combat. Dionysus spoke to the two and somehow, against all odds, convinced them not only to bring Ariadne back, but also his mother Semele, where they would be brought up to Mount Olympus for eternal life and happiness. If that doesn't show the sheer power of Dionysus, I don't know what will. He can make the impossible possible without a single drop of blood being spilled. Dionysus is often portrayed as either a young feminine looking man with long hair or a much older masculine man with a beard. In both versions, however, he is wearing a crown of ivy and draped in fine robes. In Shin Megami Tensei, despite his initial appearance, he is portrayed incredibly accurately. This time as the younger, more feminine version adorned with wine-red cloth, ivy crown, and pure white hand and foot wrappings. His strange skin color is a reference to two things. First being the act of body painting being an important part of the festival Bacchanalia, a wine festival popular at the time, but also an interesting reference to the color of alcohol when put under a microscope. One of the most loved and revered Greek gods for a good reason, and also a fan favorite in Shin Megami Tensei and Persona. Very well done. Next up is Varuni, Hindu goddess of wine. The next couple gods I'll mention won't have nearly as much information on them due to the difficulty of translating such old texts. There are actually two gods in Hindu mythology that are named Varuni. The first, Varuni, is the goddess of the fundamental energy of the universe and wife of Varuna, god of water, oceans, and the sky. The other is the daughter of the two gods that share their mother's name. This one is the goddess we're going to talk about. In Hindu myth, there are two types of spiritual beings. There's a ton to learn about them, but for simplicity's sake, the difference between them is as follows. Asuras are beings primarily focused on worldly things, such as money, status, and comfort and devas are primarily focused on spirituality, faith, and life itself. Neither being is wholly good or evil, but they usually don't get along. A long time ago, the devas were cursed with ill temper and decided that they needed to churn the sea of milk to create Amrita, the elixir of immortality, to regain their strength. To do this, the devas had to work together with the asuras as the task was too difficult to do on their own. Vishnu, god of preservation, centered a mountain in the sea, and Vasuki, the great poisonous snake, was to be the rope that mixed the liquid. Both races held either side of the snake to use the great mountain as their churning rod. The Ashuras held the head of the snake, and it ended up vomiting deadly poison, threatening to contaminate the mixture. But the god Shiva took the great poison in his throat and saved his entire race, forever turning his throat blue. When the mixing was done, many treasures sprung forth. Things like the moon, a tree that grants wishes, and of course one of them being the goddess Varuni, who brought forth the gift of wine and fermentation. 
Much like the other gods of alcohol, this god was held in very high regard and was even thought to have transcendental wisdom, meaning she could hear the very secrets of the universe itself. Pretty intense power for a god of fermented grapes. Varuni is portrayed in Shin Megami Tensei, but it's her mother of the same name rather than the god of wine we're talking about. Here, called Varunani, she is the aspect of Sarah from Digital Devil Saga, paired with her love interest in the game Surf, whose aspect is Varuna, matching her pairing in real mythology as well. It's a shame we didn't get a female deity of wine contrasting with Dionysus, but still a very interesting deity. Finally, we have Inari Okami, Japanese deity of sake. Finally, a god of something besides wine. Okay, it's a little unfair to diminish this god to a simple goddess of sake, as her domain is much larger than that. She is the goddess of fertility, agriculture, tea, foxes, and sake. With how important cultivation of rice is in Japan, you can understand why this deity would be considered important. It also doesn't hurt that sake, which is essentially rice liquor, just added on to her popularity. Inari is depicted commonly as a beautiful woman with long hair wearing a kimono, but her exact origin is unknown. What we do know is that her worship can be dated all the way back to around 711 AD, and her popularity only grew exponentially, now with around 32,000 shrines dedicated to her. Inari is strongly associated with foxes, more specifically the Hokkaido red fox and the yokai known as kitsune. One of the few yokai that have the ability to grow wiser and more powerful with age, even possibly gaining the ability to become essentially omniscient and bewitch humans. Despite their power, even these borderline demigods serve as messengers to Inari and revere her as much as humans. What sets her apart from the other deities associated with alcohol is her main priority being the safety of people, especially women, unlike Dionysus who loves that mad frenzy. Inari is seen as a protector of the female gender. If a man even so much as thinks of raising a hand against an innocent woman, the god will violently lash out and make sure he never does it again. Remember guys, being drunk isn't an excuse to be a bad person. The gods will not forgive you, so drink responsibly. In Shin Megami Tensei, Inari does not show up explicitly, but it can be inferred that the fox social link in Persona 4 is possibly a kitsune. Their propensity to communicate with the player with seemingly an understanding of language and the drive to help humans that come to the shrine are very kitsune-like. Their design is also reminiscent of the statues meant to depict Inari Okami down to the red scarf she wears. Yusuke Kitagawa is also called Inari in Persona 5 by Futaba, but that's just because he wears a fox mask, so I don't think there's a deeper meaning. I'm actually surprised that Inari, or at least Kitsune, weren't more prominent demons in Shin Megami Tensei, but the fox social link in Persona 4 more than makes up for it. Learning what I did about Inari makes those fetch quests so much more impactful, and much less annoying. Well, that covers just a few of the many gods of alcohol. Let me know your favorite of the bunch I covered in the comments down below, and while you're down there, leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already. I think mine is Inari. I really can't stand violence against women and have a hard time even seeing it depicted in media, so the idea of a deity always watching over to protect the innocent is comforting. I'm against hurting women. I know, only brave statements on this channel. Special thanks to Andre Vinicius de Silva Valens, Anton, Arctic Mirror, Kalos, Goose Kebab, Jeter Michelle, Just a Middleman, Matt M, Patty123, Stuart Ash, The Digital Dutchman, VideoGamer75, and many more for supporting the channel on Patreon. If you'd like to support, check the link in the description below. Thanks for responsibly consuming this Gods of Alcohol roundup, and I'll see you in the next Tony for You. Have a good one.